this fascinating book called Snakes in the Ganga has created many questions in people's minds, especially its title. So Rajiv ji, the very first question, which are the snakes and what is the Ganga here? I know of Ganges dolphins, I know of Ganges turtles, but never heard of snakes in the Ganga. There are probably some species in it. So first of all, thank you for inviting us. And this seems like uh, it'll be a very good Q&A because uh, you've read the book and you're sharp and you have a background. Uh, this is quite welcome and wonderful. Contrast to the typical, you know, people just ask superficial questions. So I hope you ask tough questions because then we feel uh, more interested. <clears throat> and I'm in good company of my co-author and she's brilliant. So we're, we're a good team ready for action. So thank you very much. Uh, the metaphor of snakes in the Ganga is this. When you are in the Ganga, you are expecting that everybody is nice. You're not expecting that there is any da dangerous person. There is no violence. There is no threat. In fact, you're off guard. You're, you're totally, you know, relaxed. And it would be a surprise if someone said that there's some dangerous things going on here. You don't expect threats and dangers. So we are saying that actually there is danger, but it's hidden. It's not visible. Uh, and it's not expected. It's coming from places that are not expected. So that's the Ganga part of the metaphor. As the space which is considered safe for us, but actually there's hidden threat. The snakes are, there are three aspects to the snakes. There is poison. The snakes are spreading this poison. And there is a place where there's a nest of snakes, where snakes are being produced. So the poison is the ideology which is being spread and the snakes are the ones who are going around biting and spreading this poison, poisonous ideology. And the nest of snakes is where they are producing more of these snakes on an industrial scale. So what is different, what we have tried to do here is take the experiences that people in India are having and organize it into a into a system, systematic theory because you know you are fighting uh, some PFI thing here then someday you are fighting there is some farmer right there is some uh, Washington Post is protesting against some article 370 issue and you wonder why Washington Post New York Times are protesting against something full page ad by some people BBC is into this the US Congress is putting some uh, threat of sanctions against India. There's some bill that says that Islamophobia should be crime in US law and they're specifically uh, targeting India for it. So all this happening, uh, then you see someone like Jay Shankar running around like a, with a fire extinguisher, putting out a fire here, putting out a fire there. That's okay, people have to put out fires, but a, a fire department will be useless if they keep putting out fires and nobody bothers where is this coming from? Who's put starting these fires. So the what we have done here is to look at all the symptoms that you are seeing, all the uh, bad things you are seeing happening, which is accelerating. You're going to see, in fact, you're going to see even more of this happening all around the world. Uh, and we have figured out where is it coming from uh, and the, what is the nature of the poison and what is what is a theoretical framework which is generating this kind of a, uh, this kind of a output, what is the framework that is used to justify all of this logic against India and its civilization? And who are these people that are going around spreading it? Where, who trained them? Uh, who trained them? Who funded them? What's behind all this? So that is three parts. What is the poison, which is ideology? Who are the snakes that are going around doing all this? And they tend to be large number of Indians, but they're many, largely being trained outside India. And then where is the nest of snakes? And we've discovered that the central area, the central think tank is Harvard, which is such a huge discovery because Harvard is considered like, you know, this is like God. They're like the Devta. We call them Vishwa Guru. We've accepted them as Vishwa Guru. But they are the Vishwa Guru of poisonous ideology as far as India is concerned. Now, there are very many good things also. Harvard is good for science, engineering, technology, those kind of disciplines. But I'm talking about your field of social sciences social uh, and social sciences, humanities, that kind of a thing. So three part, the first three part is the poison, who spreads it and where are these people being produced on an industrial scale. 
Then the fourth part is how do they arrive in India? How does this poison and how do these snakes carrying the poison arrive in India? And we are finding there's a huge network. There's Kriya University, there's Godridge Cultural Labs, there's TIS it, uh, in Bombay, there's uh, Ashoka University, there is Azim Premji stuff. There's a lot of these things. Not only these universities, but there's also these some of the places, uh, some of the people like uh, 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 Niti Ayog have taken some of these Harvard guys who are doing all this work and brought them in as advisors. And then you'll find a lot of industrialists funding all this. So this is a big, it's a huge discovery, a huge issue. It's not going to be easy to digest this in India. We think some people are going to attack us and accuse us and blame us. As long as it's in a civil, civilized way, as long as it's courteous and with mutual respect, we would welcome any criticism, any opportunities to debate. Uh, we are not hitting anyone below the belt. In fact, we are very respectful when we say that the billionaires are investing in Harvard's uh, snake factory or snake or this uh, poison factory. We are saying that they are probably doing it out of ignorance. They are not informed. We don't know why they are doing it. We are giving them the benefit of doubt. We are not saying that they are bad people. Sometimes a good person is writing a check and not knowing that it's being misused. So maybe we should be welcomed by them as people who are giving them this advice. Then they can take it accordingly. So that's what this whole book is about. This whole idea of snakes and uh, is, is sort of a metaphor for that. Right. Uh, Rajiv, as you said, this a lot of this education, a lot of this understanding has been produced in universities abroad. <coughs> and there's a proper theoretical basis for it. Now, India has been sending its professors abroad since the 60s. And that is still going on, that the professors go there, get trained, get refresher courses done from there. And then they come back to India to train an entire class of people. Your first book, you talked about the church intervention in India. Now, this place is talking about academics primarily, as I understood it. There are the numerous you know, facets to your work also in this, which is very, very all-encompassing and very, very comprehensive. So let's start with the theoretical basis of this teaching that is coming from abroad into India. And how, what is the teaching that is being generated? What is the understanding or the theories being generated outside that are going to harm India? In what way are they poisonous? So uh, one of the big surprises as far as the theoretical part is concerned, <clears throat> I've called it the Americanization of Marxism. Now you expect that Americans are against Marxism. Or they are. But they don't realize that Marxism has entered the United States. In fact, the U.S. is sort of, Marxism has been kind of reinvented and repackaged in another way. It's called critical race theory and wokeism. So most Americans are very shocked when you tell them that this is Marxism. They don't want to believe it. In fact, those who are propagating wokeism, I had a huge debate with one of them. He's saying, no, 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 this is not Marxism. So I had to convince him and then he accepted because there's... So Marxism is about oppressor oppressed. Oppressor, oppressed. People are categorized in these two ways. Uh, and, and the idea is that uh, the oppressor controls the discourse. It's the hegemonic discourse. And you have to build an antithesis, a counter discourse to dislodge it. And there has to be an all-out war between the thesis and the antithesis. So it's like a revolution. You have to have a violent revolution to destroy. And then out of this destruction, a new thing will emerge. The problem is that they've never succeeded in producing any new thing. They have no experience in constructing anything new. They have a lot of experience in destruction. So it's a destructive in practice for since Marx started, there is not one instance where after destroying, they've been able to construct something new, which is what the theory calls for. So it's a, it, this destructiveness has arrived in the United States and it's affecting America. Just yesterday, I did an interview with an American professor. He's written one of the forewords to this book. And, and I, I have this term, breaking America. So I'm telling the Americans that this is breaking America like breaking India. So we are going to come up with jointly something called breaking America and breaking India. Because it's also it's the same thing, breaking both. Now, this Americanization of Marxism has entered the Black Lives Matter movement. Black Lives Matter movement was, a, was an old movement, but... Uh, it suddenly became important after George Floyd. And they were looking for a theoretical basis because originally it was, okay, so racism, white supremacists and blacks as slaves, and now they're emancipated and they're still persecuted. And all that gets sympathy. And I also funded Black Lives Matter 
and help them and join their organization. But then soon it was appropriated by these uh, critical race theory Marxist people. So they turn it into oppressor oppress, the same logic. Once it becomes turned into Marxism, then certain things happen. One of them is that you can, there are people called protected classes, which means that you cannot criticize certain people. Uh, you know, you cannot criticize them because then you're considered racist. Then there's something called cancel culture, which means that if you are tagged, if you are branded as the oppressor class, you have no right to speak. And in fact, if you speak, we're going to cancel you, censor you very officially because you are the oppressor. You shouldn't speak. So this actually ends free speech and good discourse. And you cannot really solve problems in this kind of an atmosphere. So now the question is, who gets to be the oppressed? So who gets to decide it? Well, certain people have designated themselves as uh, uh, people who are going to decide. So besides blacks, Muslims were included. That okay, there are Muslims also oppressed. Okay, so then LGBT are included. And that's when the Dalits arrived and said, you know, we too are oppressed and we are the blacks of India. And the oppressors are the whites of India and they're all the non-Dalits are the oppressors. So this was a very good big uh, coalition. So these critical race theory people said, this is excellent. We now got the big, big uh, support. Mm. So a lot of people arrived in places like Harvard to say that uh, th there is this thing called Afro-Dalit. So the Africans and the Dalits have unified into this Afro-Dalit identity. And uh, these people are based at Harvard. There's a lot of bye-bye between them, brotherhood. So the Americans don't know too much about Jati, Varna, caste. They don't know the history and all that. They don't know the history of Islamic rule in India. They don't know that. So they, as, when this mapping is done, they have assumed that the Hindus are like the whites and the Muslims are like the blacks. The upper castes are like the whites and the Dalits are like the blacks. The straight people are the, like the white suppressors and the LGBT people are the, like the blacks. So the oppressor, oppressed has been mapped onto the Indian society in a very weird way without debate. So if you go stand up and debate, then you'll be considered you are the oppressor, you are a slave or slave owner, whatnot. It's it's strange when you when I tell them, Muslims actually came to India as invaders. Now in the United States, blacks did not come to America as invaders over whites. It didn't happen. So the logic doesn't apply. You see, uh, so and, and the Dalits and the non-Dalits are the same race. They are not different races. They are from the same uh, groups of, of uh, DNA. Uh, so the mapping of critical race theory onto critical caste theory is not logical. But that has been done. It has not been questioned. And therefore, it's got a life of its own. Uh, we, As this uh, was happening over the years, I tried getting Indian thinkers into involved. The culture ministry wanted nothing to do with it. Indian Council of Cultural Relations didn't have any time for any of this. People in India didn't have time for this. Academic scholars didn't have. You know, I could go on naming a lot of, but nobody wanted to deal with it because it's unpopular. They don't understand it. And they thought, you know, chalta hai, everything will be fine. But things have picked up and become worse. So we thought we should have this book in order to alert people that this is going to get even worse. So that's the poison. That's the intellectual poison that is now flooding India. And uh, it, as you said, uh, the last few generations of Indian scholars in English honors, in social studies, in liberal arts have been trained in the United States from uh, post-colonial studies to subaltern studies to post-modernism to now critical race theory has become the fashion. Sure. And so uh, to be considered erudite and scholarly, you got to be able to quote all these things and you got to be able to show that uh, you you are expo you are a, a person who is championing the liberation of these un uh, these people who are considered oppressed and to wash off your own guilt you have to be real tough on your own culture sure. you have to stand up and say uh, i am uh, part of this abusive culture and then they'll clap they'll send you a first class ticket to harvard and they'll give you a slot to give a give a big speech and promote you a lot of Indians are for sale. A lot of Indians are into this. And if you look at the if you look at the departments and the centers which are producing this, and we've covered each one in a separate chapter, you will find that in the last five, eight years, a few thousand people have gone through this training. Yeah. 
if you look at all the people who've been brought into conferences and seminars and given grants and all that. Scholarships, fellowships. So scholarships, fellowships. It's a very large army of sepoys that they've created. And these people are now in different Indian universities and, and Indian Indian government. This is strange. Indian government. HR departments in corporate. And they're bringing in something called ESG and diversity, equity and inclusion, which is basically corporatizing bringing into the business world all these things. So the matter is very serious and it's surprising me that nobody in India has bothered to take this matter seriously. And I also remember that they did this uh, breaking, uh, dismantling Global Hindutva Conference. Yes. And the, the critical caste theory was used as a very good tool yes. to dismantle all that because they could attack Brahmins right. and through them the patriarchy and then right. they could smash Brahminical patriarchy. Right. Through that. And it's very, yeah, the, the, the amount of evidence here is huge. By the way, I want to say one thing to people about the book because the size of the book scares a lot of people. But don't be scared because you need to read 100 pages. Okay? Uh, the, the, the way to read this book is if you read the introduction and the conclusion and in between are 22 chapters, each chapter has a one-page overview, maybe one and a half pages. So, the overview is basically telling you what's the message, what are the highlights, what are the points in that chapter. So, if you read the introduction and the 22 overviews and the conclusion, in about 100 pages, you'll know a lot about the book. And that's what you can do that in two, three hours. Then you can dive into whichever chapter in more detail. You don't have to read them in sequence. So, for instance, if you want to know why the IITs are being attacked, how they're being attacked as a patriarchy and Brahmin thing and anti-Dalit, there's a certain chapter four and you don't have to read anything else and our response to that. If you want to see this whole take on why China has taken over Harvard, how have they done differently, differently than our billionaires and how that's bad for India, there's a chapter on that. If you want to see what is Anand Mahindra's Humanity Center, it's called the Mahindra Humanity Center. What is it up to? What is wrong with it? What is from our point of view an issue? There's one chapter on that. One chapter on Lakshmi Mittal's South Asia studies. So like that, each of the each of the main points that you will find that we are making has been treated in detail in a particular chapter, separate chapters. <coughs> so uh, that you don't need to read the whole thing. You can you just read the overview level and then you dive deep as you need to. So I would request that you not get scared of this book. Uh, I remember you flagged this Afro Dalit issue in your Breaking India book, yes. the first part. Yes. And sure enough, it has come to, you know. And 12 years ago, right people could have stage. taken it seriously. Yes. People could have engaged the African community and said, don't fall for this. And because, you know, they could have brought in Martin Luther King was very much pro-India and considered Gandhi to be his mentor. But what has happened is this critical race theory does not even go along the lines of Martin Luther King or Gandhi because they were not into dismantling structures. They were not into dismantling nation state, dismantling family. They were not into all this patriarchy business. They felt that within the existing structures, blacks ought to be given equal rights. So the thing would be that within the ex existing structures of constitution, existing structure of social society in India, Dalit should be given equal status. So, but this is toppling even Martin Luther King and Gandhi. And India had 12 years of, of advice and warning from us to, to take this matter seriously. But there is no leadership, no strategic thinking. So we are sort of reacting to when a fire comes up, we go running around trying to put it out. But are we really reacting, Rajivji? Have you seen any efforts from India into understanding, really understanding, analyzing, and then creating counter arguments to this? Afro Dalit movement. No, I mean we are we, we don't see that. I mean I see a lot of uh, the first book created over a hundred uh, activists. You know, starting these YouTube channels and starting Manthan and some gentleman here was telling me they're starting a group tomorrow on Indic dialogue, Indic civilization, Indic studies around the world. I said there's hundred such initiative people have started, but they're all at a very superficial level. They're all at what I call Breaking India 1.0, which is a 12-year-old thesis we have. This is Breaking India 2.0 because things have moved in a whole different direction. So it's not enough to criticize George Soros and the church and, you know, these kind of things. 
because that's of course true but the threats that we now have of an entirely different level and far more intense Uh, Vijaya, I would like to ask you about your own field since uh, your expertise lies in curricula and pedagogy. What is your view on the inclusion of liberal arts and liberal studies in the national education policy? And is liberal arts <clears throat> truly liberating as we spontaneously use these two together as if they mean each other? So in the uh, US also, many intellectuals feel um, within liberal arts, of course, you have the sciences. Uh, but if you take all the departments that end in the word studies, um, they are all about grievance. So grievance studies is the overarching umbrella. And so you have um, grievance studies, fat studies. Fat studies is not about getting people healthy, but it's about um, uh, you know body, uh, you know not avoiding body shaming and things like that. So um, and that's why you see models these days that are you know morbidly obese. So the, you know that's sort of the product of uh, you know. So it comes to the popular culture. So um, so you have uh, so gender studies, uh, sexuality studies, queer queer studies. Um, so all grievance studies. So the um, you know one of the um, I, I forget who it was a professor in America who sort of against all of this talked about the idea of you know idea laundering. So a bunch of people uh, get together and and say okay this is something that we feel that uh, we should start uh, studies on and and basically an idea gets laundered into scholarship a bunch of them get together they peer review they form a journal they reference each other and then they don't let anybody else in and they form this little you know cabal of whatever they're studying so even in the us you have people who don't recognize these things as uh, you know, studies as, as proper sciences or proper fields of knowledge, if you will, because they don't, they're based on lived experience, not rationality, things like that. So uh, with the NEP opening up the floodgates to foreign universities, there are lots of problems because A, um, I mean, they might have thought that we would avo avoid people uh, sending their kids overseas and we can instead have these you know, which was a noble uh, sort of idea. But um, what happens is you have a, a lot of money. So, for example, Ashoka University, you spend uh, 10 lakhs a year, over 10 lakhs a year, f you know, for four years uh, to get uh, a bachelor's degree in gender studies. And Another university I know charges 45 lakhs for a four-year program in liberal studies. Right. <clears throat> yeah. So, so, in it's, it's, so it's expensive. So uh, and uh, then you have play, uh, so basically what are they giving? So when we have MIT having a venture with the uh, Korea University. Now, when, I, when you hear the word, uh, I mean, the name MIT, you would think science, technology, you know, space programs, but MIT is not coming for that. MIT is sort of selling you uh, economics uh, through, through this uh, social justice lens. So this criti critical consciousness, as they call it, and critical consciousness, you think, is like critical reasoning and it has nothing to do with that. It has, it's basically critical consciousness is the CRT lens of oppressor oppressed in anything you you see in life. So in this particular case, MIT has a, um, uh, so the Saudis fund uh, MIT, they have a poverty action lab. It's called M uh, Jamil something Poverty Action Lab, JPAL it's called. And, um, and JPAL has a, 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 you know, a partnership with Korea University to study poverty. Now, not many people know that Saudi Arabia itself has uh, 25% poverty yeah, in Saudi Arabia. So they're not solving their problems at home. Uh, Saudi Arabia has 7 million people that don't have bank accounts out of which 65% are women. Saudi Arabia has um, a very classes that are the super rich, then the sort of middle class, and the rest of the people are poor. Um, Saudi Arabia is the number one ranking country that wastes the most amount of food in the world. So we can go on. But then Saudi Arabia gives uh, money to MIT for JPAL, and JPAL is, you know, having... Uh, so that's the liberal arts that we get. We are not getting... We're stupid if we think we're getting science, technology, things like that. So this is MIT that's doing this, yeah? So uh, in our book, we show all the different relationships of what is the liberal arts. So what's the bang for the buck? So now Harvard has come to India. They've opened an office in Delhi. Um, so, and it's an ATG, 
yeah it's it's for do- donations so not only we had billionaires give money there now they want the arm aadmi to give you 100 rupees and um, you know and it's a donation so they get mm-hmm. a tax break and so essentially we're losing revenue in, in you know we're losing uh, income tax you know which is your tax money which is going towards uh, giving harvard a break to spread this poison further Also, didn't we give a huge grant of about four point one million or something to award prize money to Amartya Sen? To yeah, Harvard. That was in two thousand twelve. So there was a Ronan Sen, mm. uh, who was the Indian ambassador to the U.S. And Ronan Sen, uh, uh, when Amartya Sen got his Nobel Prize, you know, two thousand twelve, when he gave five five million dollars, and he was begging Harvard, would you, you know, would you please take this because we have we are so. thrill that amartya sen got the uh, nobel uh, prize and many thinkers and journalists in the us said how it should not take it because this is a third world country and 5 million dollars is a lot of money 2012 5 million dollars you know and um, and then um, uh, ronson was like excited because uh, finally harvard said yes and took the money right now Ronanson also uh, incidentally um uh, there is a group of mormon mormon uh, church. church and um, there are lots of uh, it's sort of a cultish kind of you know uh, church and there are uh, there are many people who leave the church and there are mormon files that get leaked and so in the mormon files is embedded a video where a senator from utah where the mormons are predominantly present uh, says um that we want missionary license uh, uh, visas and we're not able to get it through the front door but we've been told by the by the uh, indian diplomat Ron- ronanson that he will arrange it for us through the back door ronanson gives 5 million arranges visas for you know over 100 missionaries you know to come into india and uh, and then he uh, of course retires and uh, and right before he retires or right after that he gets the padma bhushan or something he was so i can understand that the government doesn't know all these things fair enough and you think liberal arts everybody wants there's a thirst so let's open it up fine but i think the government can look at the case of singapore so yale university had this partnership with the nus in singapore and they started the yale and us uh, um, deal uh, partnership now in the mou the singaporeans were very smart they just had a 10 year agreement which could be renewed in 2024 and but this whole thing did not go to well uh, they had a class called a, a, a course titled i think modes of dissent and resistance in singapore and this just the singaporean government just flipped they said what is this you know uh we don't have why should you teach this just because you have the academic freedom it should be used wisely and it doesn't fit the ethos of singapore so uh the education minister went to the parliament and said this just doesn't work for us um they produced another paper from the lee lee kuan yew uh public policy uh think tank saying that over 90% of singaporeans think they respect each other they respect all races they uh you know they love brotherhood and and therefore uh, you know we have our own think tank that's saying this so they rejected uh, the yale a us partnership and they have not renewed it so they've kicked out yale so at a time when other countries so and singapore also has a diversity it has malays it has indians it has um, the Ch- ethnic chinese and and the Ch- <coughs> ethnic chinese were called uh, uh, you know chinese patriarchy and so they were trying to do the same thing and uh, they said we don't want this because singapore if you uh, damage singapore's reputation as a country that has these kinds of divisive uh, you know uh, population then uh, all our businesses will go and we cannot afford that because singapore is very very dependent on being a stable government and uh, it's very important for our business so they just chucked yale university out of singapore and said no more of this Mm-hmm. So we can learn. See, I mean, it's like all of us, right? If we want to make a decision, we look at our friend circle and find somebody who's smart, who makes good decisions, and say, "Hey, so what did you do about that?" So I think even Indian government can learn, right, from Singapore. But do we have the will to do it? Because uh, as you've discussed in the book, Rajiv Ji, China has a very good stronghold over Harvard. And in fact, I was checking after reading this book. I was che- checking the Anand Mahindra Humanities Center, and they have a Chinese humanities department within the. humanities department so is china also not vulnerable to all of this is china also not facing all this you know kind of attack from harvard or are they in a position of power and they are repulsing all of these 
or stopping all of these or they are in control of all these attacks so actually china's situation in harvard is quite the opposite of india uh, china china's billionaires have been very patriotic uh, india's billionaires are more self serving uh, there's no strategy putting all of them uh, in a nationalistic way to approach so a good example is uh, T H Chan School of Public Health is based on uh, it's named after Chinese, and the two sons of this Mr Chan they named it after their father. Uh, they are they are associated with the Communist Party of China, which we've shown. Uh, they brought in three hundred and fifty million dollars and they gave it to Harvard to change the Harvard Public School into the Chan, and so that is basically aligned with Chinese policy. They have never criticized China's role in the COVID. Uh, they have basically they're silent on the problems in China. But Piramal has started the Piramal Ch Public Health at Harvard as a subsidiary under the Chan School. So Chan is the umbrella public health. Underneath that is the Piramal, and in the Piramal they're doing all kinds of uh, projects and funding and this and that. Uh, fine, it's their right, it's their money. They can do what they want with it. But we pointed out where some of the reports are things like you know during COVID, maybe minor where minorities were not given proper treatment, Dalits, Muslims, they were not given proper treatment by the Indian government. So even a field like public health is being used to kind of talk about the divisiveness of society rather than talking about public health. And you would think that a patriotic uh, uh, people like uh, Pairamal, and I consider them good people, for certainly, you would think that they would have championed Ayurveda. They haven't. You would think that they would champion that India has done a remarkable job in the vaccination of any country in the world. I don't see that as a topic. You would think that uh, WHO, which didn't uh, help, didn't certify and didn't acknowledge the Indian vaccine, they should have put pressure on them. They uh, they invited the head of the WHO for the convocation and he's a VIP and he comes to Harvard and he's celebrated but they are not lobbying the Indian point of view they're lobbying the Chinese point of view so you, if you take public health in, at Harvard as an example and the same is true in many departments uh, what has happened is the Chinese giving is a very strategic giving they are very aligned with the, the billionaires are aligned with the government they come together the other thing is, and the, in, on the Indian side, the billionaire comes and he gets his kids in college in the Harvard, or he, he, you know, he gets to sit on a board or gets in a prestigious committee, or he just feels like I'm a billionaire and I'm now world world elite now, R rather than just being an elite in India, I, I go with uh, uh, somebody on their private jet to some uh, island somewhere. I go on the yacht with this famous guy. I. A hobnob with Bill Gates and with Warren Buffett and all these famous people. So the Indians have are more into their personal, you know, lifestyle and feeling glorified and all that on a world stage. It's not necessarily that they are doing this out of nationalism. They are not doing it patriotically. So you will find that Chinese engagement in the United States is mainly bringing tech people to bring technology back, including stealing some technology. So they are into STEM. They are not into human humanities. They are not sending their students to learn human rights, social justice, gender justice, grievance justice, LGBTQ justice, women's studies, feminist studies. They are not sending ch uh, Chinese for that. They are sending the Chinese students in, a, in an orchestrated way, in a strategic way, uh, to study the technologies and sciences and medicine and all these kind of things which are useful for China to bring back this knowledge. And they were doing it for a long time, which is why they advanced so much in, their, in those fields. And uh, the Indians, on the other hand, have no uh, strategy. So you can go for STEM education or you can go and study some human rights and become an activist and somebody who's divisive and all that. Nobody in India has got a policy on that. I don't think the HRD ministry has a policy. I don't think the external affairs ministry has a policy. I don't think the national security people have a policy. I don't even think they're studying the problem and taking it seriously. So the Chinese versus the, and the Indians have a very different uh, positioning in Harvard. And Rajiv Ji, I would like to bring back the spotlight on the Afro Dalit movement again because mm -hmm. it concerns our country, our families also. So how is the work at Harvard under the Afro Dalit umbrella affecting our families? How is it targeting the family structure? How is it targeting the children? How is it targeting the entire structure of Hinduism? So you know, 
it's very interesting. You would think that, okay, if you want justice for a race or a justice for a certain caste, that's fine. But what does it have to do with family life? Why, why, what family life? Precisely. So now what they have come up with as part of critical race theory is that you must dismantle family structures because family reproduces the bias into the next generation. So the theory is that child is born and because the parents are biased and the parents are oppressors, the child will also grow to be an oppressor. The parents are patriarchal. The parents are a supremacist. Uh, Hindu supremacist or white supremacist in the case of America. So therefore, the fa unless the family is dismantled, uh, uh, you know, the family is going to perpetuate this. So these people who are into the Afro Dalit, they're going around telling Indian students that you should revolt against your parents. <laughs> you should. And so parents are spending all this money to send their kids. And parents don't know that this kid is going to come back and actually is not even interested in the parental your heritage. So this is why you will find there are a lot of these billionaires, the senior generation, were very patriotic and very loyal to the, our culture. Next generation, they go and those kids are not interested in these things and they've come back cynical and antagonistic and, you know, and the parents are shocked. They don't know what happened, but those four years in that university have switched them around. So this is a very, uh, this, these are things that ought to be brought to the surface. And people should, we, we all we are saying is we want to be able to discuss these, but we are not allowed to because there's cancel culture. I've experienced cancel culture for 30 years now. And I, I'm one of the earliest victims, long-term victims. Before the term cancel culture was around in a popular way, I was experiencing cancel culture because I refused to toe the line. I am not a dogmatic person saying I'm right and you're wrong. I'm saying I may be wrong and I'll change my mind, but let's talk. Let's discuss. I have a right to speak. And you have a right to speak too. You have a right to disagree with me and criticize me, but I have a right that too. So I'm totally for open discussion but you and must debate. must engage. It must engage. And this is not allowed in places which are claiming to be uh, the, the centers of freedom and intellectual life and whatnot and the word mm -hmm. liberal and all that actually are basically propaganda. It's a, a, uh, it's a, the peers, the peer, people who do the peer review are a kind of a cartel and they've come up with a, uh, ideology which is kind of a commission and uh, syndicated ideology and that's what is perpetrated. If you follow the line, you will be doing very well in your career. They'll give you all kind of benefits. You don't follow the line, then you'll be cancelled, you put aside, you'll be attacked, all of that. So isn't Harvard South Asian Studies doing almost the same work that Oxford did when yes. India was colonized? Yes. So we've drawn that parallel also that when Oxford, Oxford played that role for the East India Company, they were the center of Indology, studying India in all kinds of ways. And that's where the East India Company officers were trained. And then based on the thinking of Oxford and the scholarship of Oxford, they set up 20 different colleges in, in England where they would uh, have a huge scale operation to train people. Mm -hmm. And then they would set up uh, mirror images in India to do the same. So now Harvard is playing that kind of a role. It's got so much prestige. It's got so much money. It's got so much clout. Nobody can bother to stand up. I, you know, it's very interesting. There is no other book which challenges Harvard. This is the first book that actually takes on Harvard. Because you would think that big players always get some resistance. Mm -hmm. There are books on criticizing Bill Gates. There are books criticizing all kinds of big shots, uh, big institutions. Uh, Books in America are criticizing the church, big books criticizing any president. But, you know, Harvard has somehow managed to be such that, you know, there aren't people who are standing up and doing a systematic study and saying Harvard is the snake nest. And so we are sticking our necks out and, mm -hmm. take, you know, we're out there taking our, uh, taking our, uh, putting ourselves at risk. But that's what you have to do. Yeah. You've also said on page 342 that the census, maps and museums were three instruments that the colonials, the colonizers used as, you know, databases for themselves and also to keep an account of their assets. So these maps are all still being reproduced in the form of data, in the form of presentations that we see in various seminars and various, you know, think tanks, which present data to you, very selective data which convinces you that these are the people who have brought the truth to you and you were living in, uh, you know, you're living in a haze till now. 
So what is Harvard contributing? What kind of think tanks is Harvard also nurturing under its umbrella? This is a very huge topic that you've raised. So there's a famous book called Imagine Communities, uh, which is taught all over the world in the post-colonial studies, American professor wrote in which he did a brilliant job. He says that what the ways, the way the British uh, captured and controlled the colony is through the census, the map and the museum. Because these are ways you can, uh, you can sort of represent a, a people in your own framework. And then that's who you become. You are being mapped and cataloged and, and classified and uh, your identity is in terms that the colonizer has decided. So this is the naksha, this is a map and you belong in that. And so they did it through this mechanism very systematically. And this is this is the way you assert power over these people in a very sort of intellectual way and emotional way. Uh, so they're dislocated and disconnected from their own sense of who they are because their sense is based on, you know, they are belong to this jati, they belong to this gotra, they have this kula devata, they have this linguistic thing and they belong to this gharana of music. I mean, their sense of who they are is very differently done. So you've disconnected them from all the traditional ways of self-representation and turned it into the colonizer representation. It's a representation system that you've completely re-engineered. So now this is also happening in modern times with artificial intelligence and databases where the representation of a community is being done by these machine learning things. And then the people who control this are profiling and deciding where you belong, what kind of thing you respond to, what are, what kind of thing you re respond against, what kind of ad we should put there because you are more likely to click, uh, how to arouse anger in you, which group you belong and whom are you likely to hate, how to make you hate, how we can make you fight. So that's how the British used to do without this technology, they using those tools, they could do divide and rule. Because they understood that we do this thing and we can incite them to fight against those guys. Or, or, and we do this thing, we make him happy. And we do this other thing, we make them angry. So they knew how to control people. So the new mapping, mapping India at Harvard is so sophisticated. They have a project called Mapping the Kumbhela. They did that project and I produced a report 10 years ago or something. And we gave a few lakh copies of English and Hindi. So much uh, uh, excitement and people were very angry and upset. That this Harvard group is called Mapping the Kumbh Mela. And they're looking at the caste structure, the gender structure. Are Muslims being given equal rights? And uh, can they do their lamas over there in the Ganga? All this kind of stuff they were doing to create trouble. Uh, so that people could come in and do all that. And we raised this awareness. But at the same time, we were, we were disappointed at the lack of action on the part of the Indian government. And in fact, the Indian government invited uh, places like Harvard to come and study even more. So then there is mapping the partition. All in the next few years, all databases, all archives, notes, you know, uh, articles, videos, uh, whatever exists, uh, oral testimony about the partition will belong in Harvard because they are buying it. Uh, there, If you have a family history and you want to present it, they'll fly you there, give you the money and you turn over this material and it belongs to them. It belongs to your archive. So they're sucking in from India, from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, all these places. They're bringing in all the material concerning the partition so that what happens is by in five years from now, if you are a young person who want to do research on the partition, any aspect of the partition, there won't be data in India. There'll be data in Harvard. You have to go there and under their terms, uh, giving you permission or not giving you permission, how much permission, they'll decide. You'll have access to the database with which the information, the written material, uh, you know, the Biblia, all of that uh, to do your work. Like right now, if you want to study the British Empire, you have to go to England. There are so many libraries there where they control all this stuff. So even when they digitize, we feel very proud they're digitizing, but they control the, the rights to it. And they can turn it off, turn it on whenever they want. So we have in this book mentioned about a dozen different database projects in Harvard. Mm. Uh, they are do doing uh, DNA gather gathering of mm. Indians, DNA gathering of Indians on a large scale. Uh, Americans and Chinese are gathering the databases of DNAs of people around the world, especially India, more so than the Indian government has. Uh, 
Then there is archive on uh, tribal languages, uh, tribal issues. Then there is another billionaire, a younger version of uh, George Soros, who's creating a databases on legal issues, legal fights that people are having, a database on who's suing whom, what kind of legal things happen. Uh, and so if they want to quickly do a search on who are the Indians in this region, in this particular area, who are financially in trouble and have legal fights with each other, and the fight tends to be an inter-ethnic or inter-religious, quickly it'll pop out, these are the targets. So those are the people for sale, maybe. Those are the people you can buy and influence them. And how to influence them. So the database is immense amount of power, especially with this new computing stuff that's coming out, the AI kind of stuff. And these databases are all owned by Harvard. So public health databases, databases on... Seeds. Uh, seeds. Seeds. Agriculture. Seeds databases. So, you know, all of this is being presented as separate. So the partition project is separate. The Kumbh Mela project is separate. In Harvard, it's all together. But in India, it comes as separate. So it comes as, okay, now there is this uh, uh, seeds database. They're going to tell us about varieties of seeds and how to make them better. Uh, there's another project that they're going to help poor people in the villages in India mm -hmm. about some kind of uh, their caste structure database and their languages and whatnot. So, but we are so naive. Nobody in India is putting it all together. Harvard is putting it together. So this new mapping of India, like the old mapping was census, you know, uh, the, the census and the map and the uh, museum. The new mapping is all of these kind of things. Harvard is far more powerful than Oxford ever was. And we don't even have anybody interested in any of our departments who could even give us time of day to bother reading this stuff. And we've been doing this research for a long time and wanting, and uh, uh, until COVID, I used to come here four times a year and looking for all kinds of audiences, uh, ministries, whoever will listen, but people will listen to you, they'll give you a nice meal, they'll give you some chai and samosas and talk to you and give you a selfie and send you off. And But they really don't care. And I'm surprised at the lack of intellectual depth in India, uh, even to study threats that face us. I also read about this organization called PARI which is asking people to upload their photographs, videos, and documentaries of their experiences, which they are collecting in their database. And also they're running a teacher's training program that you've mentioned in yes. your book. Yes. So the teachers, as well as the students, are free to write their own histories. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a big right. So this is such a post-modernist thing that nothing is fixed. There yeah. is no theory that is fixed, which you can learn from, and everything is experiential. Right. Your own experience. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. So, so data is power. And, and data is now going to be in the hands of people outside. Between the Americans and the Chinese, I mean, the data mapping of India is so active. And we're, we're up for sale. Totally. Basically, that's why India On is On the data, data side, uh, there's also Ashoka University's Trivedi Center, which collects data on every politician from the panchayat level up. Yeah. Uh, their gender, their language, what their education level is, how much they've been earning, how, who are their friends, the entire thing. So can you imagine? Um, and this is funded by uh, the French ministry, you know, external affairs ministry and uh, American, you know, Cal University of California at Berkeley and some other institutions. So it's just, and this is not a left or a right or a BJP or a Congress issue. It has just data on all the election, every election they stood, how many votes, votes they got, how they lost. A database it, on the entire Indian democratic uh, from independence to today, central level, state level, the history panchayat of level, panchayat yeah. level, the history of every single election, who won, the history of a candidate, the history of... You know, modeling the Indian democracy, building models, predictive models and figuring out where to intervene and whom to influence, how to change. This is when you have a database, then you know how to intervene. It's like your psychologist knows a profile of you. They've got a database of you in a psychological sense and therefore they can manipulate you. They can help make help you. They can do whatever they want. It gives them power over you. So this is the ultimate of that kind. Uh, that we have not even bothered to understand it. We don't even, our people don't even understand that this, what is going on and what is the significance of all this. But why are we so blind to all these interventions in our own country, Rajiv Ji? Is it that we don't understand, we do not connect the dots? Or are we just unwilling to work hard enough to create an alternate narrative? 
you know I, the thing is that i have been very disappointed in the sense that i when i did my first breaking india book i thought that people will help me and we will do all these projects together instead they copied the idea the, they did the lazy thing of copy plagiarize and start their own movement and their own activism and their own channel here and there so 100 copies of it happened 100 copycat movement started rather than taking it to the next level rather than helping and saying okay now you've taken it to level x now let's take it to level y together they everybody copying the level x and making it their own so that that is very dissatisfying you you don't see traction in terms of helping move these kind of uh, intellectual movements forward neither from the government not from the public not from the academic world not from the gurus we tried all of those so somehow people are just sort of very complacent just going about life you know i i i i and at the same time people are when you talk, tell them about problems they're very passionate they're very emotional but they're not doing anything about it so this is their aversion to hard work or planning or strategic understanding i think the indians lack strategic thinking uh, it's more like tactical what we call jugar so jugar means i'll fix this problem if this something happened so i'll put some tar around it and it fix up sar thik ho gaya thik ho gaya aapko kya chinta hai hum jo hai ho gaya ab ho gaya rather than going behind it and saying okay now how i how to fix it in a way that next time it won't happen what was the underlying cause and let's address the underlying cause so all we are doing here is we are taking all the fires that indians know about all the snakes that have been biting you all the different kind of poison that you've had and trying to figure out now where did it come from what's the theoretical framework where where are these snakes being made what is the institutional mechanism the factory which is producing them keep keep answering and going deeper 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 but people you know there's hardly any original research of this kind that would take people that deep there's several dozen phd's material in this book yes. i'm telling you very honestly uh, we have we have 100 pages of bibliography 100 pages of bibliography we have 1600 references in the end now we have gone to the extent that every reference we have given where we have quoted something we have downloaded it put it on the cloud so even if the guy deletes it we have a copy we have a screenshot so if we are quoting a video some guy making all this statement on video and we're quoting it we've downloaded a copy of that video so this guy bishwajit sitting there he's in charge of this so if they delete their web their youtube we still got it that's how thorough we are so we are opening it not only as a book but as an opportunity for other people to come do their research so you can take this uh, uh, the material that we are going to put on our website and you can write, write your dissertations on this we would love it we would love to help people who want to do their dissertation and their research and their books taking this idea even further that's a fabulous idea yeah. i think it's a lot of opportunity for young researchers yes. to yes. go ahead yes rajiv ji you also went to harvard you offered them funding yes. you also offered a lot of you offered to uh, uh, fund a chair yourself yes we Tell funded us about your experience please so i the harvard thing starts with the harvard part in this book starts with my 30 years experience of encounters with harvard and the encounters were two kinds one was that a lot of indian knowledge over the last 200 years which has been digested into western thought has been done at harvard a lot of indian philosophy indian psychology indian medicine indian linguistics harvard was a center of taking indian knowledge and digesting it and calling it their own there were so many people emerson thoreau whitman t s eliot uh, whitehead in term in the process uh, uh, philosophy he took basically buddhism all this i've talked about and i wanted harvard to basically include this in their curriculum that you know you should talk about world uh, world history of philosophy world philosophy world uh, uh, history of psychology world uh, you know talk about arthashastra dharmashastra contribution to political thought uh, and and economic thought they were not interested in those kind of things at all uh, and and what then i would criticize the negative part where they are doing a lot of negative things on india 
So I I said that the positive things you are digesting and calling it your own and not giving due credit, and the negative things are what you are emphasizing and exaggerating. So I was into that, and we funded Indology conferences at Harvard many years in a row. What what is now at that time there was nobody else funding Harvard. They were very happy that there's one Indian who's funding us because nobody knew Indian was funding. I'm talking about uh, 25 30 years ago. all the way till about 2005 6 we were funding harvard every year my hard earned money my chota mota whatever i had putting into it and saying okay let's get a visiting professor so once we got ashok akrushkar who's a one of the important sanskrit scholars once we got arvind sharma uh, and you know to get into them as a visiting professorship we funded it so and we funded so many projects there and i only i found that you cannot change their mind there it's like uh, what i call it uh, feeding the crocodile you feed the crocodile thinking he'll become like a puppy dog he'll wag his tail become sweet to me but after you fed him any amount of stuff he'll still want to eat your heart your hand if crocodile dna is what it is you're not going to change his dna so feeding the crocodile doesn't make any sense so i stopped funding them because what happened is i started responding to what they were doing i'm paying them money there's a dissertation and i have a problem with it i'm not opposing the uh, you have every right to do this but i want to give my opinion okay. and i want to sit when there's a discussion going on i'll sit in the audience raise my hand and i'll be on the record making a statement and they didn't want to hear all that they didn't want to hear all that although they are supposed to be the center of free speech they did not want to hear all that so uh, i found that uh, i was getting cancelled which was very embarrassing for them because i'm funding all this so they would write to me saying infinity foundation is great but raji murut is trouble maker yeah. so they would write to me and say things like acha aise kijiye aap you come the president want to see you and you'll have a nice dinner we'll put you on uh, interview in the newspaper you know they wanted to sort of flatter me and kind of bribe me so that i leave them alone but i'm not built like that so i i thought i have to work even harder to criticize to figure out what's going on so at the end of the day i said no more and we packed our bags no more harvard but we gave millions of dollars worth and you know but we learned a lot then there was a period of a few years when actually they were they were silent and they were not really that aggressively anti india and anti hindu because we gave them big hit and but then when we withdrew Our Indian billionaires took the place, and ten times more, fifty times more, hundred times more money they're throwing at Harvard, exactly on the same projects that we were opposed to. So I was opposed to them. I was criticizing them, put them on the back foot, put them on the defensive. But when I withdrew from there, our own billionaires were very happy to go in and fund them and give them money and feel very proud at and all that stuff. So you I feel very. You also met those billionaires, Rajiv. I have met Anand Mahindra. Mahindra in his office. A very decent man. Hmm. very nice decent man i have met ajay piramal in his office piramal towers very decent man extremely good people uh, I, i have met lakshmi mittal in uh, in uh, bahamas or wherever there was this conference uh, i i think on a personal level they are very nice people uh, and i my feeling is that they are not adequately informed about how their family name is being used how their money is being used in ways that w- You know, if you start reading, what all are the quotes from their center? And the strange thing is that when the guy is standing up and making these speeches that are really negative towards us, uh, it's uh, the, the backdrop says Lakshmi Mittal Center, mm-hmm. and the guy is standing there making a speech. Obviously, it ought to embarrass Lakshmi Mittal that you're using my name. Mm-hmm. The person who's the director of the uh, Mahindra Center, uh, he's a well-known one of these postmodernists, very. dramatically radically anti india one of these postmodernists and he is well known for his views and uh, uh, we we name names criticize them here so if i were one of these billionaires i would say hey listen let's let's take it in the right spirit uh, rather than getting angry at this guy let's uh, look at what they are saying and see if it is valid if it is valid then we should take some corrective action i really wish they would pick up the phone call the harvard people and say you know we don't want our name or our money to be used in ways that our countrymen think is not fair our test is our we are first loyal to our country and if our countrymen are upset at the output you have a right to be free thinkers but not with our money so if the if they would get together and do that harvard will change because harvard cannot afford a scandal that indian billionaires pulled out because they are because they claim that they are hindu phobic 
Harvard would be scared because, you know, our billionaires don't realize how much power we have. Our billionaires have a lot of clout and a lot of leverage, but they just don't know. <coughs> and nobody has advised them until now. We, are, we, we think we are doing an advice kind, uh, kind of job on their, for them. Uh, no, but nobody until now has really shaken them up and said, you know, you do have the power. You should actually use it for, to, uh, to help your country. You should put in the projects which are things like, uh, I, I had a course which we funded called uh, Unacknowledged Contributions from India. Un uh, India's unacknowledged contribution. What are all the things India has done that are not given credit? And we taught a course like that. They never like it, but our guy went and he taught a course like that. And then another course was biases against Hinduism in the American Academy. We funded a course at Harvard. It was in the course catalog and it was taught. So, but you know, you would expect that the billionaires would fund such things. Mm. Corrective. Yes. You should fund things that are correcting the bias in your and making it in your favor rather than funding whatever they want to do and keep having more bias. That's it takes right. courage. You know, but if you have an inferiority complex, you're very happy that some Gora guy is going to pat your back and give you a big hug and all, then you're not going to stand up to them. So you no matter how many billions you got, the point is if deep down you have a, in your skin you have scared and you have an inferiority complex and whatnot, you know, but if you are when you are facing those people, you are very scared to take them on. That's probably our problem. Whereas the Chinese are very forthright. Yes, they are. They're very deeply nationalistic also, Raj. Very forth. You know, we did a survey. We asked, uh, we wanted to do a survey with Indian students on experiences. One of the things that came out was experiences of what, how are the Indian students different than Chinese students. So, the Indian student gave me very interesting insight. They said that uh, in many classes, uh, you have a peer evaluation, which means that not only teacher evaluates you, but other students evaluate each other on class participation. Uh, you, your paper is read out, others will evaluate it. So they said that whenever there's peer evaluation, the Chinese give a very high evaluation to each other. Indians knock each other down. Indian knock each other down, stand up and say, oh no, you're this, oh, you're like that. Very proud that I'm bringing bring you down. Chinese not in, in, in public uh, bring each other down, they'll support each other. A very interesting comment that Indians made about this. I know. There's of something an, in our character, I don't know what it is. I know of an army daughter, uh, Rajivji, who condemned her own father who had won a Kirti Chakra, posthumous, in a public space, and then she got a seat at Harvard. This is actually quite common. Yeah. They, they, will, uh, they will incentivize make such a person a role model mm -hmm. and ask many others that you also can get award. So, others can also be recruited yeah. through the same method. Yeah. Very simple. Uh, which, uh, now that uh, the government has come down so heavily on the NGOs, so FCRA regulations are quite stringent. What other methods are being used to make inroads into Indian organizations, especially the government ones? Um, <clears throat> FCRA is actually is a thing of yesterday. Uh, it's antiquated. Nobody, you know, uh, uh, the I think the church has used some of the other organizations to funnel money through. But um, so there is a uh, even in um, even within the U.S. Uh, the big billionaires like um, you know Facebook Zuckerberg. Uh, there's a Zuckerberg Chan something. Um, it's an LLC. It's not an NGO. It's even within the U.S. So the idea of having uh, an LLC is they, they pay less tax. It's a pass through. They pay a bit of tax. But you have total privacy in terms of all your dealings. There is no mandatory um, disclosure amounts that you have to you know uh, disperse by the end of the year. I mean, in nonprofit organizations, you have to spend a certain amount of money. So they don't have any of that. They can just, you know, just accumulate the money. They can also, um, uh, you know, uh, when, you, when you start an NGO and you're on the board, you have to have other people uh, and you really don't own it. And if, if there are some uh, violations, uh, the nonprofit would be shut down and the money would go to the government. So they avoid all of this. But the biggest thing that they get is secrecy. So if you look at Omidyar uh, you know, that, that we have over here, yes. uh, they do uh, a lot of projects which are 
for profit on the on the so they so there are no these it, it comes under regular business visas you know so the, all those things you can do it's not an ngo it's anymore F- fdi uh yeah foreign direct investment and then um, whenever you see the word social impact it means it's a sort of a non profit thing that impact investing a, impact investing social impact all of that is essentially it's activism in a for profit shell but with you know they either collecting data or um, you know pressurizing the government now if you look at so that is one thing that has changed so fcr is just so yesterday it, it, nobody uses it and we are still cracking them but yeah so the second thing that's happening um is uh they are using places like uh, ashoka university again they have a, 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 a department for philanthropic studies or whatever now gates foundation and omidyar again they all fund this to uh, and using indian researchers and scholars to find out number one so within the philanthropy field you have uh, two areas one is called services the other is called um, rights and advocacy so they find that indian philanthropists are give are more focused on services which means you provide education uh, health care food things like that so those are services and very less on advocacy and um, which is all the social justice nonsense now they are concerned that the government is you know coming down heavily on foreign uh, and usually so in india the rights and advocacy is usually funded by the foreign ngos like oxfam and all of them so they are very concerned that with the government you know canceling licenses and all of that we they need to the the concern is uh, we need to make these guys who are funding services to move towards rights and advocacy so how do we do that so then there is this other department in ashoka which is called behavioral studies how do you use ai and behavior modification for a large population so now you'll see gates right he goes to kriya university and he funds in the economics you know kriya is big on economics and finance and all that so uh, they are very troubled by the gates is very troubled by the fact that indian women do not go to work their labor force participation is low how do we increase that so we have of course nothing we are all you know uh, free to work or not but they all but they do not um respect a choice of a woman to not go to work and take care of the family so how do you incent that so first they study who's doing that and of course it's with a caste lens again they they blame the upper caste women uh have are lacking in mobility to participate in the labor force so it's again patriarchy of the hindu system that's not allowing them to work uh, and maybe it's just a choice but they don't care to find out so gates is very concerned why indian women are not working uh, because when the indian woman works then they the children are you know uh, there's nobody to pass on this culture and all of that and this patriarchy that rajiv ji talked about then gates goes to ashoka's behavioral you know uh, sciences department and funds a lot of uh, projects on how do you change behavior of, of of a large diverse population so that you can message correctly you can do all of that right so and then he mixes matches and then he he does what he has to do so that's the you know um, uh, they are, they're using these newer ways of non profit you know uh, um, um, implementation if you will now so this is really really you know uh, troubling because um it, they they change they try because with social media and ai and all of that you'd be able to change for example during the covid times they they were very concerned that uh, uh, the average person on the street is okay with saying i don't care if i live or die and uh, you know karma will take you know care of it so this fatalistic attitude is very predominant in the hindu society how do you rid people of of believing in this karma theory so dangerous so this is dismantling hindutva in a different way in the guise of oh, you know where the average man says you know it is what it is i have to work i have you know so so, so there's that danger now another interesting thing that ashoka works on for these foreign ngos is um like for amnesty international funded project would be um how uh, 
so there is risk when I, so you want all these people from moving from services indian donors to activism and advocacy but how do you do that uh, because there is risk you know the individual donor doesn't want to stick his neck out and and support some hindutva cause or some he he wants you know or, or or some leftist thing because the government might change or whatever so he is risk averse so they come up with these ideas of um getting uh, groups of people together so that the risk is mitigated you so if a group of 10 uh, wealthy you know high net worth individuals get together then it's it's like a, a small co-op of people who are just sort of doing and so you can't blame all 10 of them um so how do you mitigate risk right and that is essentially what you see in that isf isp mf or whatever there is this coalition for media where uh, kiran mazumda everybody who's who of indian you know corporate honcho is over there and, and so that's the idea you create this you know a, a, a group a coalition of these people to fund leftist media and here and there they throw a swaraj or something in just to appear neutral but you know 9 out of 10 would be you know mm-hmm. far left media yeah anti sort of uh, the narrative so that's one way then there is this other so similarly it even there's a, there's an india foundation of the arts it's a it's a foundation that um, you know invests in uh, gives grants to artists now um, and so the the um, head over there says very proudly that uh, see art is about art is political let's face it she says and so it's again gender caste uh, this the usual genre of things that come you know so and um, so one of the so one of the reasons people fund through us is they don't want to fund individually so they they just give it to us because we we just invest in art and uh, and nobody can tell us how to invest uh, or whom we you know which artists we choose so you give the money to us and then we will you know do that and may all the corporates lots of the corporates invest india foundation of the arts you can see the you know the 3 to 5 crores they invest every year give giving small grants to uh, so it's political activism through art i mean so it's endless so these are the newer ways you know which which which, which are not direct you know there are not uh, it's just not money coming in doing they are trying to change behavior they're trying to move people from services to advocacy they they having shell sort of structures uh, they're mitigating risk so these are sort of you know uh, these are the latest in in how they're very sophisticated they're using technology ai behavioral modification i mean and we are still like sort of knocking on fcra so uh, that ship has sailed long ago <laughs> true Uh, can we throw the uh, house open for the audience uh, i have a question regarding the woke culture right and uh, as you already talk about the cancel culture so if you discuss anything you are basically canceled right i have listened a lot of your interviews also so when i talk about uh, talk about woke culture and uh, this new thing is coming right uh, gender uh, there is a difference between sex and gender right this thing they are trying to push in india as well <laughs> and i think our government uh, i mean I, i'm not sure if they are also gone woke they are not realizing this but they are also trying to put shit into the curriculum right so how do you see that you know impacting the youth what i feel like 10 20 years back bollywood has a lot of influence uh, on the youth and you know the sex before marriage and all those things become pretty common in our society and if you talk about uh, the this gender thing i think this will uh, destroy the whole family culture and the basic fabric of the society how do you see that okay i think you're on to something very important i i, I agree with your observation uh one of the worst things in the national education policy 2020 is that they have imported harvard's liberal arts this wokeism in the name of liberal arts so they are taking even the iits and bringing social sciences and liberal arts and rather than making good engineers they're going to make mediocre engineers and activists who are into all these kind of things 
so the this is my criticism actually people think that uh, nep is great and all that maybe for stem they are trying to do things and for the as far as their policy on liberal arts is concerned there is not any investment in developing indian models of liberal arts indian theories vedic theories of social sciences vedic theories of you know there is i don't see that i see that uh, when you when you say that you have to do liberal arts those those people are going to open the the front open the flood gates to more of these harvard type people coming in uh, and so what you are talking about wokeism is being brought in by the indian nep uh, and and uh, i was also shocked that uh, ncrt put out a training manual on gender with this whole absolute copycat of lgbtq activism I mean, I have no bias against LGBTQ people. I think they are wonderful people. I have a lot of friends in that organization, but I feel that uh, you don't have to dismantle Hinduism and attack Hinduism. In the introduction to this book, we have we have had a, a testimony from a Hindu woman uh, uh, who has written. She's an LGBTQ in the United States, Indian Hindu woman. That her experience is that joining their their version of LGBTQ requires. required her to denounce and give up hinduism as a precondition because that was required she could not be both and she decided that she'd rather be hindu and not be part of their organization and practice her whatever she wants in within the context of hinduism so there is all this wokeism is also deeply anti hindu and 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 anti in indian nation state and so when ncrt brings in such a thing they are just completely stupid and so a lot of people protested and then they said okay we won't do it but you know that shows their mentality Uh, they're not even aware of what they're doing. The I think this HRD ministry needs a whole education. They need to be educated. Actually, the, before they can educate the country, they're miseducating. The other uh, institution is Indian Council of Cultural Relations. They are the international uh, body of Indian culture. And the Nehru Centers report there. The culture uh, attaches report there, and I and interact with them. Now I must say. Dr. Sahasra Budde, who is the head of that, is a minister. He's the head of the ICCR. Very decent man. Uh, and and you know, on the one hand, they gave me this award. This uh, June, they gave me this award as uh, Indologist of the Year or something like that in the Indian uh, Consulate in New York. So I'm uh, on the one hand, I felt okay, they are recognizing. But on the other hand, besides this ceremonial thing, as far as the content is concerned, zero. Uh, zero in, in, interest and zero appreciation. So I don't need an award for myself. I I would rather that they help the cause. Uh, you know how facilitate us our work is a better award than recognizing an individual. So I think that they are really not strategic people. Neither HRD nor ICCR. And the strange thing is, Ministry of External Affairs got Jay Shankar, who is a very smart guy. For a change, we've got a person who really stands up and speaks. But he needs to be back with the whole research cell, and uh, there is no insight into you know. Once uh, Indian Consul General in New York uh, was going to Harvard many years ago, and he was a friend of mine. He had come and. Uh, Spent time in my house and wanted to understand the landscape, and I told him about all the problems. So when he was going to Harvard, uh, he called me from his limo and said, "I'm going to Harvard and both Yevo. I'm the chief guest, Flana, and so give me some points what I should say." And it was a nice sounding topic. For the conference, so I said, "But tell me who else is invited? Who else will be on the stage?" So he just he said, "I don't know, but let me just tell you." And he read out those names. So I said, "Listen, this fellow is a Khalistani. This fellow is a Kashmiri separatist." And I told him the background of all those people. I said, "They will get out of you and make an embarrassment out of you." And you know, they will. In fact, that's exactly what they were going to do. So he got so scared. He called up his office. and they also they verified because i gave him some links and some background they, they, they had not done any homework and he turned back and said i'll call in the emergency and not show up so indian 
I was surprised. I said, doesn't your ministry have external affairs have a cell in Delhi that uh, before your ambassador goes somewhere and makes a fool of himself, some he should check and they should see where is he going, who are these people that are inviting me. I mean, certainly you would do a security check for physical security. You should also do a security check for intellectual security. Uh, is this guy going to the wrong place? And he, he had no. I was his research department. Me. That was a. So this is the state of affairs. So I'm. Uh, Aditya and uh, currently I'm masters uh, with a blend in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and an MBA. Uh, so uh, my heart is beating too fast. Uh, it's been years uh, listening to you guys. You have been part of a formative experience uh, for me, and uh, I've been vaccinated, so I won't be standing up. Please pardon. Uh, I, I have a two-part uh, question. Uh, given that the uh, the the problem is uh, multi-domain. There are many factors, variables. Will the solution look uh, be a generational solution morphing over time, or is there a crystalline vision already apparent? And secondly, uh, given that uh, I uh, I am into this field and currently, like I have a project, tentative project with uh, the museum in Janpath, scanning uh, these broken murtis and all, and trying to at least get something uh, reconstructed and the meaning. Uh, across so uh, any advice on that front and secondly it's like uh, it doesn't require a serious question uh, yeah, yeah uh, it, it's just a joke kind of thing so are the snakes since the uh, time of Shiva or, or are they just recent in Ganga and like what's the context is it relevant that like all the neighboring countries they have the moon and the crescent and like uh, is the game being played since <laughs> so by the way snakes are not all bad you know I mean, there are poisonous snakes, there are wonderful snakes also. So, we're talking about the poisonous snakes here. Huh? The, 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 there is a, even in our, in our uh, Kaliya, in, the, in, the, in our Itihas and all that, Kaliya was this uh, poisonous snake in the Jamna, spreading poison, and then Sri Krishna had to come and take care of him. So, the, our tradition also had both kinds of snakes. So, I don't want to uh, blame snakes of, as a species. You know, we're, we're not against snakes as such. And your other question on, uh, you want to answer about the what to do about fixing education is what he's saying. The his real question is fixing education, how to fix, because that's really what you are after. So, as far as fixing education is, um, step one would be, like Rajiv ji said, not to partake in liberal arts till we get our own liberal arts. Uh, not to spend money, not to, essentially to boycott that. Uh, but, Secondly, to also understand what the foreign liberal arts is. Um, for example, I'm a mechanical engineer. I have no lena dena with liberal arts, never liked it, never wanted to do it. But sort of, <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I, you know, I have to read Marxism and all that language, which is just so tedious to, to read. Um, and you have to understand language because um, what, so you, so the way they spin things, right? And it's a very good, because it's coming into corporates it's coming everywhere so they'll catch you one way or the other you can't escape it so uh, the difference between equity and equality you have to have a clear idea because they both sound good right so uh, equity is essentially what that lady ta talked about where equality of outcome where they're looking for everybody to be the same and if they can't lift the, somebody up you bring everybody down so that's equity Equality of outcome, you know, uh, and yeah, equality essentially is equality of opportunity. You leave the doors, you support people, you you give and give encouragement so that they can enter. So, so these these sort of liberal arts words sound very good, like uh, you know, like gender is a social construct. So it doesn't sound that bad. Uh, in fact, yesterday I was talking about uh, you know they want to uh, destigmatize uh, pedophiles. So that's coming in gender studies. It's something that you should know. And so they call them minor attracted persons. So a, a pedophile versus a minor attracted person doesn't seem so bad. Right? So um, so they're trying to destigmatize it and, def and thus make them an oppressed group. These are dangerous things. You should know if you're tomorrow you have a child and, you know, somebody says, I'm a map, nice to meet you, <laughs> alarm bell should go off. So essentially, you know, uh, so, the, so you should be aware so that you can then fight and then study and then oppose these, these things in terms of policy, whatever. So you can't be, you know, blind to it, but we should not invest our dollars 
into this or my rupees into this sending kids abroad or you know putting them in uh, in ashoka you know so that's the thing नमस्कार सर नमस्कार सर तीन घंटे दो घंटे में मतलब एवरी बिट वॉज सुपर इन्फॉर्मेटिव एंड एज यू से राइटली दैट मैनी डेजर्टेशन कैन फ्लोट आउट ऑफ दिस छोटा सा सवाल देश में बयालीस सौ एम एल एज हैं हमारे मोदी जी के एक एग्जीबिशन से इवेंट से मैं अभी आ रहा हूँ ग्लोबल लीडर बट सर वो जो विजन है वो फोर्टी टू हंड्रेड एम एल एज तक फ्लोट डाउन कैलकुलेट करेगी विद लॉट ऑफ मेक्रेसी एज द जेंटलमैन ही वॉज प्रोबली भारत लविंग पर्सन बट डेंट वॉन्ट टू टेक दिस ट्रूथ दैट वी आर ऑल्सो वेरी इनफिशेंट नेशन एंड कभी हमें बचाने के लिए भगवान राम आएंगे कभी कृष्ण जी आएंगे कभी मोदी जी आएंगे बट वी वॉन्ट टू डोंट वॉन्ट टू डू अवर जॉब सो माई कभी हार्वर्ड आएगा छोटा सा सवाल सर पिछले दिनों वन ट्रिलियन डॉलर इकोनॉमी के लिए यूपी गवर्नमेंट ने एक टेंडर फ्लोट किया था विच वॉज वेरी सरप्राइजिंग नाउ रिसेंटली वी हैव दिस इन्फॉर्मेशन दैट जॉर्ज सोरॉस इज पुटिंग वन बिलियन डॉलर इन डिस्टेबलाइजिंग द हिंदुत्व गवर्नमेंट सो इफ वन पर्सन इज बिकमिंग द फेस दे विल बी लॉट ऑफ शेडो इन्वेस्टर्स ऑल्सो लाइक इफ समी वॉन्ट्स टू से दैट आई एम वो पुट वन बिलियन हेयर टेन ऑफ द पीपल डू नॉट डोट आइडेंटिफाइड दे वुड पुट इन देर यू नो देर देयर मनी so india mein politician is not very well educated forget exposed or aware he puts his job to the bureaucrat bureaucrat hires a consultant hmm. as we have been hiring lot of companies from pwc every big project goes to pwc ey we have the election coming sir george soros wants to destabilize the government won't he tie up with some consulting company where he would put in his people to make grassroots connections with anganwadis this that block panchayats where the mlas are just floating on the modi ji wave so this is a very grave concern and uh, through you i would like to put a word i am very sure you you speak to a lot of people on the on the top side that this everything that you said should be uh, you know worrisome but i think bjp will listen because of the 2024 elections because it's going to be very critical yeah so so this is my point sir that how do we increase the awareness level of those mlas that being elected who are 10th pass 12th pass and they are going to decide the careers of uh, people doing management mtech phds how do we percolate this sir so i'm not uh, uh, an expert on how you would educate the mlas because that's a whole different thing but one point i want to pick up and we make a comment on you mentioned george soros Uh, being actively involved in all that, we are pointing out that George Soros in his 80s, he's still a bad guy and all that. But there are far worse guys who are half his age with 10 times more money, multi-billionaires and tens of billions. And we've identified one case study. We've got a whole chapter, big huge chapter on one case study of somebody half his age. but far wealthier and far more dangerous because he's doing the kind of thing you are fa- afraid of he is going down to the grassroots through investing fdi investing it is not fcr it's fdi investing in technology venture capital angel investing and has 500 million dollars invested already in recent times in india i'm talking about only india and his target is the bottom half of the country in terms of socio economic the poor people in other words he's trying to go after them and he's offering them services that will kind of bypass the government so he'll be the uh, portal he'll be the way you go and you get to my marriage certificate driver's license file a pil file a case against this get your in other words basic services he's offering and lot of uh, gov- uh, districts are licensing his software allowing him to get in so he is he is saying i'll automate you i'll make it easier for you like the british like the east india companies told the rajas that i'll run your government i'll run your courts i'll 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 run your police in other words i am ta- out you outsource your government to me I, so he's kind of outsourcing the district level at the lowest level of society taking over using artificial intelligence using a whole lot and he's saying that i'm bringing the digitization down to the lowest level which he is but in a in a way that he controls all of this so that's really taking the george soros down to the trenches on a much bigger scale and with far better technology than soros has so that's the what we are trying to so the purpose of this book is to identify that isko piche iske piche kuch karo 
इसको थोड़ी सर्वेलेंस करो इन्वेस्टिगेट दिस काय फर्दर स्टॉप फंडिंग दीज पीपल वी आर गिविंग यू दैट काइंड ऑफ अ डेटा दैट्स व्हाट वी आर ट्राइंग टू डू हियर एंड आई जस्ट वांट टू ऐड दैट व्हाट वी हैव पुट आउट देयर इज वी हैव टू टाइम्स एज मच मोर थिंग्स दैट वी वांटेड टू पुट बट यू नो दिस इटसेल्फ वाज यू नो वी जस्ट पिकड uh you know the most poignant sort of things but that we could put out several volumes more volumes because you know there's so much material we have to decide what to include uh good evening vijay ji and good evening rajiv ji since you have this 40 years of experience that you have gone through talking about india protecting indian values in america my last question to you as i said this is the last question so how have you been able to still see howard being the gatekeepers and not allowing things that should actually come into the academic domain are they still the gatekeepers because i heard saying that they are picking up information they are allowing information to come in people who are available and available for sale are being taken in and data being collected are they still gatekeepers for the good people only and they allow the bad stuff to come in so this is my question yeah that is our thesis our thesis is that in uh, science engineering all these kind of fields are very good very good and uh, if i were to advise one of the billionaires where to put his money if he wants to be famous and in the good books of harvard i would say uh, uh, sponsor a chair in the physics department and uh, you know or something like that maybe maybe mithal should be sponsoring something in metallurgy or material science because that's his field and he'll get something out of it but stay out of things you don't know nothing about and these people don't know they are not they should not go into human rights social justice gender studies because our, our billionaires don't know that and they are just funding mischief so you know harvard is good and bad depending on which way you go every organization has these and rather than funding the, uh, letting them decide kahan par paisa jayega or writing a check and saying aap kharch diye mere naam laga dijiye aur jaam invest karna kar do you have to be more actively involved so maybe the billionaires have to roll up their sleeves and become more active in ma- managing how that money is going to be spent as you said auditing is more important and we are we consider this book to be an audit in fact i've said this is like a civilizational audit like they hired ernst and young or pwc or deloitte to do a financial audit we are saying your philanthropy needs to be audited from a civilizational point of view in fact each of them should do an annual get an annual report by a neutral independent expert on civilization not harvard's view harvard writing a report on what we've accomplished but an independent people going in and saying this is what they're doing with your money so that they are informed about it and they should take this annual report make it public so let the public know and then let the public discuss, discuss and debate what's good and what's not good about this program so how much cia is feeding these snacks so cia is certainly a factor cia is certainly a factor um, you know cia cia is definitely involved in most of these think tanks and uh, and so on and cia is involved in campuses that's well known fact there are a lot of books on cia and the american campuses cia's recruitment in harvard is a particular topic of tremendous uh, interest so cia is involved in that but the harvard people are in in many ways extremely powerful and they influence the cia also harvard harvard influences world economic forum i mean that's the in the conclusion chapter we are showing you world economic forum uh, you know the guy who starts it klaus schwab who runs it he is a product of henry kissinger he was a student of henry kissinger and when he when kissinger was in harvard and the two of them decades back came up with this idea that something outside america outside harvard name with an independent thing should mold world thinking bring all the leaders of the world into one place and make certain things fashionable so now all this uh, esg the esg movement started there only you know the, they they championed it so a lot of the harvard ideas one of the places they export is us government another is think tanks another you know so on but one of them is world economic forum also so they have many outlets to distribute this ideology oh we'd like to end this session now and uh, i really thank uh, rajiv ji and vijay ji for participating in this enlightening us awakening indians to india and this is really a bhagirath kaj 
and it's ongoing for both of you and i hope uh, we all can also contribute to this awakening and also get on to real work on ground so that this work also bears fruit i thank you i thank you for being here namaste i thank the audience for thank being here thank you very here. much